Well, good morning, Antioch, and Happy New Year. Uh, of course, I'm not talking about the calendar year, which I know most of us can't wait to turn the page on. I'm talking about the Christian year, or the church calendar, which starts today, the first Sunday of Advent. Um, Advent, if you don't know, is the first season of the church calendar, and it's important to understand that Advent isn't Christmas. Uh, we kind of think of them as sort of the same thing, but Advent is actually its own distinct season. It's the four weeks leading up to Christmas. So if you got the Antioch newsletter yesterday, you saw Pastor Pete's Advent playlist. And if you look at that, you'll notice that it's not Christmas songs that celebrate the birth of Jesus, but it's actually a list of songs that have to do with preparing, waiting, anticipating, getting ready, longing, that sort of thing. And so Advent is a season marked by expectant waiting, and specifically waiting for God to show up, anticipating God's arrival in our world. And I think we're in a place where Advent maybe makes more sense to us this year than in years before. Like we have this collective longing for things to change, for things to get better, or either for things to get back to way, the way they used to be or for some new reality to come in. Uh, even just the, the observation, how many people are already decorating for Christmas or maybe started like way back in October. Even for me, this is the first year I've put up my Christmas lights before Thanksgiving. I think we're all just longing for good news, for hope, for change, for the next thing. And so um, it's the perfect time to enter into this season of Advent, this season of longing and waiting and anticipating God's arrival. Um, last week, we announced that uh, we're going to be entering the story of the church calendar in a whole new way this year, at least uh, new to us. And we're going to be using a tool called the lectionary, which um, a lectionary is basically a Bible reading plan designed for Christian worship. And so you'll notice that this morning in our liturgy, instead of just one scripture reading, uh, we've had four uh, from the Psalms, from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, and from the Gospels. Those are the readings based on this week's uh, lectionary. And so um, we are going to be, for the next six months at least, ordering our Sunday liturgy around the uh, readings in the lectionary. And so <clears throat> what that means is that instead of um, various sermon series, we're going to be preaching according uh, to the passages that are assigned. And the thing that I love about it, just again, is that in a time where there's so much uncertainty, there's so much unknown, there's so much change from week to week, even day to day in the world, it's really comforting to attach ourselves to something that gives us a sense of rootedness, a sense of connectedness, uh, that has um, a historical and a global reach that's beyond just our own world and our own experience of it. And so as we uh, give ourselves to the Word of God, um, as it's kind of laid out through the readings of the lectionary, we're trusting that He's going to meet us each week and um, that His Word is going to be exactly what we need. And so I'm excited to begin this journey together, and uh, we're going to dive into this week's passages. So first, I've got a little movie trivia for you. Uh, here's the question. What do all of these movies have in common? Now here's a hint. What is the storytelling technique that all of these films utilize? Here's the answer. All of these movies start at the end of the story. They grab your attention by beginning at the end. 
And it's usually like some sort of chaotic scene where you have no idea who these people are or how they ended up here. And then they go back to the beginning of the story and they introduce the characters and the narrative unfolds from there. And when you get to the end, then it all makes sense. It seems like it was kind of a big thing in the 90s. Um, but it's also an ancient Eastern way of telling stories as well. Now, it's easy to miss but the church calendar actually starts at the end of the story. It starts by giving us a preview of the day when Christ will come again to make all things new and to establish his eternal kingdom on earth. And so if you pay attention, you'll notice that all four of this week's scriptures emphasize the coming of God's salvation in the future tense. So in Psalm 80, we repeat this declaration that when God shows up, then we will be saved. Then we will be saved. In Isaiah 64, the prophet's crying out to God and, and crying out, God, will you return to us? Will you help Israel and heal us in our time of distress? In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul reminds the church at Corinth not to lose hope as they wait for the return of Jesus. And in Mark 13, Jesus tells this parable about servants who were waiting for their master to return. And so this week, as we launch into this new year, we begin at the end of the story. Now maybe you're going, wait, I thought Advent was about getting ready for Christmas. What does the second coming have to do with that? Here's what you need to know. When we talk about the advent of God, God's coming to us, God's breaking into our world, we're talking about it in the past, the present, and the future. And this week, the emphasis is on the future. Or another way that, that theologians put this is that advent is God's coming to us in history, in mystery, and in majesty. So when we talk about God's coming in history, we're talking about Christmas. We're talking about the first advent, when God came to us in Christ. He came in history. And then when we talk about God's advent in mystery, we're talking about the present tense. We're talking about the ways in which God shows up and breaks into our world today the times where he draws near to us, the times where he makes his presence known to us. And finally, when we talk about God's coming in majesty, we're talking about the future tense. We're talking about when he will come again, the second advent. If Christmas is the first advent, the second coming of Jesus, or the second advent, is when he comes in majesty. And so the reality is, is that we join Christians around the world today acknowledging that we live in the time between the Advents. We live between the first and the second coming of Christ, or the time between the times. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the idea of waiting, preparing, anticipating for God's arrival in the past present and future tenses, um, but this week as we begin the journey, the emphasis is on the coming of God in majesty. So um, eschatology is the theological term to talk about your working view of the end, end times, last things, essentially where is human history headed. And the truth is that everybody, not just Christians, everybody has an eschatology. Everybody has a working view of where the world is headed. So again, to think about movies or, or books, think of all the post-apocalyptic uh, movies and TV shows and stories that we've seen. These um, stories that imagine this future dystopian world. Um, some great nuclear bomb has gone off or there's been sort of some sort of biochemical or natural disaster that has destroyed the earth and the survivors are left fighting off zombies or whatever they need to do trying to rebuild society. 
So we have this post-apocalyptic dystopian eschatology portrayed. Or we have this whole other genre of stories that's utopian eschatology. It imagines this future where humanity and technology have evolved and integrated to create this wonderful world that's clean and functional and safe. And so when we think about dystopia, utopia, we're talking about eschatological uh, views of the world that shape our consciousness. Or, think about much of the language and rhetoric that's being used in the political moment that we've been in for the last several months. Think about how often people on both sides of the aisle, so to speak, talk about the results of the presidential election as the thing that's either going to save the world and save our country or the thing that's going to destroy the world or destroy our country. Those are eschatological uh, ideas that we throw around associated to politics. And so everyone has an eschatology. Everyone has a working view of where history is headed. And though many of us probably don't spend a whole lot of time sitting around and contemplating the end of the world on a regular basis, I would argue that what we believe about the future deeply shapes the way we live in the present. What we believe about the future deeply shapes the way that we live in the present. Now the passages we've been given today don't go into a whole lot of depth and detail about the second coming and everything that is going to go down and everything that's going to happen between now and then and Christians have and do land in different places when it comes to our eschatology and what it is that we believe about how everything is going to happen. But the thing that is abundantly clear if you look to the Bible to shape your eschatology is that regardless of what happens between now and between the second coming uh, we know how the story ends and so if you flip to the end of our story in Revelation 21 and 22 we're told in this beautiful vision then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The main thing that I want us to emphasize and to really get is that the emphasis in the story of the Bible is that at the end it isn't about God taking people away from earth up to a place called heaven. But it's this beautiful image of God bringing heaven to earth. That God in Christ will come to this world that he created, to this world that he loves. And in his son Jesus establish his eternal throne in this place and remake it and rebuild it and restore it into <clears throat> a new world which is the world that we all long for and so we can argue about left behind and rapture charts and all that kind of stuff but it's so clear that at the end of the story it's not about Christians escaping earth and going to heaven it's about God bringing the fullness of the kingdom of heaven to earth. Now, here's why this is so important. If we miss that that's the way the story is headed, and instead we think 
that the emphasis of the biblical story is getting away from earth, detaching from this world. Um, sometimes you hear people say, well, it's all going to burn anyways, right? So when that becomes the way that we understand the future history of God's world, it begins to really deeply shape the way that we live in that world now. N.T. Wright said it like this, Evangelicals gave up believing in the urgent imperative to improve society about the same time that they gave up believing robustly in resurrection and settled for a disembodied heaven instead. And so we know that the invitation of Jesus is to follow him within this world. He calls us to lives of love and forgiveness and justice, caring for the poor, loving our enemies, proclaiming a gospel that's good news of great joy for all people. And if we embrace an eschatological vision of the future, where this world is kind of an afterthought, then we're not going to be able to actually follow Jesus and actually receive his invitation to partner with him in the reconciliation of all things, including us. And think about this amazing vision that we're given in Revelation 21, this vision of a world where there's no more death, no more mourning, crying, pain, no more war, no more cancer, no more abuse, no more COVID, no more suicide or terrorism or pollution or rape. It's a world of shalom. It's the way things are supposed to be. And at the center of this new world is God himself. It's not just that a new world has come, it's that God has come. He has come to us. And this is the hope that the biblical writers put forth for where human history is headed. And so what we believe about the future, consciously or subconsciously, radically shapes the way we live in the present. So if we believe that one day God is going to come, and he's going to make everything new. Then how does that shape the way we live now? Well, the first thing that it allows us to do is to lament. To lament is to voice our sincere sadness that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. In our Old Testament passage from this morning, Isaiah 64 has been called the most powerful song of communal lament in the entire Bible. If you pay attention to this prayer or to this song, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. He goes on, it's this prayer of lament that's crying out to God from a place of desperation, from a place of pain, from a place of brokenness. God, where are you? We long for your presence. We long for your kingdom. We long to be able to see you, to sense you, to perceive that you're near. God, where are you? Oh, that you would tear open the heavens, this barrier that exists between our world and this world, though that you would rip it apart and that you would come. We long for you to come. We wait for you. The Bible has a very realistic view of the world and a very realistic view of humanity. 
almost the entire story of the Bible takes place in what we would call a fallen world, a broken world. A world that doesn't look much like at all the world that we're told about in Revelation 21 and 22. So what do we do about that? Well, as those who believe that one day God will come again in Christ, we're able to look at the brokenness within the world and within ourselves and lament it to bring those honest, uncensored prayers of pain to God. In the face of cancer, in the face of brokenness, in the face of poverty and need, before we try to do anything about it, the biblical authors invite us to turn to God and to acknowledge this is not the way things are supposed to be. In a strange way, I've found that the eschatological hope that's given to us in the Bible, in a strange way, actually makes engaging the pain and suffering of this world a little bit harder. Because we know this isn't how the story ends. Because we know this isn't how things are supposed to be or how they're going to be forever. If we didn't have that hope, we would just accept it and say, oh, stuff happens. Life's hard. But we know of the promises that God has for us. And we know that the pain, the suffering, the injustice, the sin, the brokenness isn't the way things are supposed to be. And so we're invited by the scriptures to lament. Now, culturally, that's a strange practice. We don't really know how to do that. It's not something that we have a whole lot of customs and rituals set up for. In fact, what I've noticed is that even when somebody we love dies, fewer and fewer people actually hold funerals. Instead, what we hold is a celebration of life. Well, that's okay, but you start to understand that we don't really know what it looks like to lament, to mourn, to grieve loss. And so we want to turn it around into a happy thing, a celebratory thing. And so the invitation as we enter into this season of Advent is to continue to learn how to lament to continue to cry out to God in those moments where we long for the heavens to be torn open and for him to pour out his presence upon us. I know that for some of you right now, you don't have to imagine what that would feel like to feel so disappointed in God or desperate for God that all you want is for him to show up. All you want is for him to draw near. All you want is for him to hear your prayer. Oh, that you would open the heavens. And so if that's you today, know that you're not alone. And though we aren't physically able to be together to worship today, you belong not just in this body of believers, but in God's family around the world and throughout history. As those who live as a people in waiting, a people in longing, a people who as hard as it is at times would continue to trust and to hope and to cry out for God to break in and bring his world to our world. Think about what would happen if the church actually lived deeply into this vision. Bonhoeffer said that the church of Christ witnesses to the end of all things. It lives from the end. It thinks from the end. It acts from the end. It proclaims its message from the end. 
If you go back in church, church history to the fourth century, there was this beautiful vision. If you think about the beauty and the complexity of the places of worship, the cathedrals, the church buildings, we look at them now, if you go to a place like Europe and walk through these incredible cathedrals with their art and their beauty and their mystery and their wonder, and we are kind of confused by that, but what they were doing was building little embassies of the New Jerusalem, that they understood that the church would be a place where we stepped into God's future, where the, the ground beneath our feet is the kingdom of heaven. Now, not in its fullness, not in its, in its entirety, but a glimpse and a preview. Now, even if we're not talking about our church building, what would it look like for a community of Christ followers to live in this world as visitors from the future, as those who know that this world isn't just the way it is, that God has a plan and a promise to make all things new. Back in Isaiah 64, he is praying this prayer of lament, but then when he gets down to verse 8, he says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father, and we are the clay, you are the potter, we are the work of your hand. Don't be angry beyond measure, Lord. Don't remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. Now, for us to think about God or to refer to God as Father is pretty familiar. But here's what we need to understand, that this prayer in Isaiah 63 and 64 is actually the only place in the entire Old Testament where God is referred to as Father. That would have actually been kind of a pagan idea that the Israelites would have avoided. But it appears that they're at a place of such desperation that three times in this prayer, the psalmist cries out, we have nothing left. We have nowhere else to turn. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. If we fast forward in the story a little bit to Mark chapter 1, the first advent has taken place. God has come into the world in Jesus. And in verse 9 of chapter 1, it says, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Now here's what's amazing. I'm confident that the author of Mark had Isaiah 64 in mind when he retells this story that he witnessed. The ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah's prayer of lament comes in the person of Jesus. Isaiah cries out, God, would you tear open the heavens? Would you come to us? And as Jesus comes up out of the water, the heavens are torn open. The Spirit descends like a dove. And God the Father announces His love for His Son. And what's even better news, in our New Testament reading from 1 Corinthians today, he ends by saying, God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul's saying, we are called into fellowship with Christ, which is more than a relationship, more than a friendship. It's intimate language speaking of being made one, joined together. We are now made one with Jesus. We are united with him in such a way that what's true about him has now become true 
about us. And so we also, in those moments of desperation, of longing, of loneliness, of brokenness, when we cry out for the heavens to be open, we hear this prayer answered in the Father declaring that you are my son who I love. With you, I am well pleased. And Paul emphasizes all this by reminding us that God is faithful. And so the good news of Advent isn't that we are faithful in our waiting, because we often aren't. The good news is that God is faithful in his coming. He has shown us that faithfulness in his first coming, and so we hope and so we wait, and so we long for the day when he will come again and restore all things back to himself. So Antioch, as we enter into this season together, may you be attentive to the prompts of the Spirit that would cause you to become aware of the places of lack the places of need, the places of unmet desire within your heart. And would you use those as a diving board to learn how to lament and how to bring all of yourself uncensored to the God who loves you and is pleased with you. Love you guys. <laughs>